What's up, Bodybuilding.com listeners? My name is Danielle Bitts, and welcome back to the BBCom podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jake Boley. Jake is the founder of That Fit Friend. He's often regarded as a go-to resource in various performance shoe communities. He's been reviewing shoes and training gear for over seven years and has hand-tested over 400 pairs of shoes. Jake is known on the internet and YouTube for blending his review processes with strength sports and personal training background. Jake has a master's in sports science, a bachelor's in exercise science, and a CSCS. He's been personal training for over 10 years, helping hundreds of clients get stronger, lose weight, and accomplish their goals. He uses his exercise science brain and personal training background to make curated and thoughtful review content on the fitness gear that he's testing. Jake, welcome to the BBCom podcast. Thank you for having me on. I'm honored to be here right now. Awesome. Well, we're excited to jump in. We're excited to have you on today. And we're starting out with topic one, as usual, everybody, building Jake. So this is our opportunity to learn a little bit about our guest, where they come from, the story that brought them here today. So Jake, tell us a little bit about your background in health and fitness and tell us about, you know, point A to point Z of what brought you here today. Yeah, for sure. So I guess it started back when I was 12, 13. Dad got me into lifting. I played ice hockey growing up. So very into sports, lifting, et cetera. About 16, 17, I decided, I don't know where I got it in my head, that I want to move to New York. I grew up in St. Louis, and I wanted to be an editor at Men's Health. So basically, I wanted to work in fitness editorial. So basically, from 18 on, I shifted my whole career and trajectory of life towards that single goal. So 19 rolls around. I moved to New York to go to college. That's where I started doing my exercise science bachelor's. Eventually went back to do my master's, was also training all throughout college. And my thought was... If I get the educational background and training, that's better to then tie into the editorial background so that way I can kind of be my own expert and whatever everything else and have a level up, I think, on just journalists who report on the stuff but then have to go out of their way for quotes. And eventually finished my master's, was still training in college, landed a job at a company called Barbend.com, which likely a lot of folks listening have seen. They are a strength sports media site. They cover CrossFit, Strongman, weightlifting, et cetera. Worked there for four years, was their first employee help them build up a lot of different verticals for their fitness content and eventually got to a point where I was just burnt out and started asking myself, what would I want to do in an ideal world? And that's where that fit for in my business now kind of came to full circle in the sense of tying in my training background, but also love for design and performance gear because growing up, like I wanted to be a designer for like apparel and stuff like that. And that's a whole other story we could talk about, but it basically tied all these things together and being my own boss seemed really interesting. Like I never came from an entrepreneurial background. So taking that leap was a complete leap of faith. I had no idea how it was going to go. I had like no money saved up or anything, basically just started on a whim. And yeah, three and a half years later, that fit friend has been my bread and butter, my baby. And that's what I do full time. Um, have the website, YouTube channel and the social channels. And we have a really dynamite community. And On that, I basically share fitness content to tie in the coaching background to scratch that itch because I think it's very important if you're going to be reviewing performance gear to have, you know, the background there and also be walking the talk, basically. It's a rare combination with the editorial and the journalistic background blending with the exercise science and and fitness. You know, it's it's a hybrid that we don't see too often. And it's definitely a unique POV to be able to put this type of content out. Let's back up and talk about what goes into achieving a degree in exercise science. Tell people a little bit about the learnings that come out of something like that, how that blends well with the quick follow up that is the CSCS certification. Right. So give us uh, some contextual background there. Yeah, in college, I was going to Hofstra University. That's where we actually met. And um, the basic like foundation of that is, you know, biomechanics, learning your basics for personal training, how to navigate that and navigate clients and everything else. And I think what really helps with the educational background in that context is also just personal training at the same time, because it almost blends like this academia with actual practice, because a lot of times I don't think academia really delivers in the sense of, the situations you're going to navigate from a psychological standpoint with clients and just how everybody is different and their biomechanics and how they think and how they move. And so the schooling was really fun and interesting. And there was a lot of, I would say, biomechanic focus in the Hofstra program. And I think they did a really good job of trying to set us up for success if we wanted to go like the formal 
college coaching or collegiate coaching or professional coaching route, or if we wanted to do our own personal training thing or find something else. But, but yeah, I think for me during that time too, like the blending of the writing component, that's what I felt like it was kind of lacking. And so that's why it was for me very important to intern at places to where I could write and do freelance stuff. And I think for most trainers in school, if you're going to school for exercise science, writing is such an invaluable skill to build up and doing it just over and over and over getting reps in because it likely your program won't have a writing focus in it. I think it could be huge and it can open up so many doors outside of just training. And then all of a sudden you're doing freelance work for different companies and blending in your coaching background. And then you also, you can market yourself better if you want to go to your own business route. The foundation of like getting an exercise science bachelor's, because I have a lot of folks who often ask me, is it worth it? I think it is worth it in the sense of giving you a level up over, you know, just going to get your personal training certification because you should be doing these things in tangent to one another. I think having that educational background, teaching you the foundations of biomechanics and some of the teachings in the sense of how to navigate different contexts of training and different settings, whether that is from a healthcare perspective, a sports perspective, a collegiate team, professional team, et cetera. It's really cool because it gives you, I think, just more exposure into, okay, how could I realistically take this career and degree into different directions? Um, but all that to say, I think it's also very important that if you do go to school for it, you definitely want to be personal training at the same time and blending in what you're navigating on a day to day because academia, I think at times, and I think more schools are picking up speed here, they kind of drop the ball in the sense of like prepping a lot of the students for the day to day of what personal training looks like or like coaching or, you know, offering you a different lens into how this degree can basically help elevate your career. And so Blending in that personal training element with the academia side when what you're learning in academia is cool because then you could like take things that you learn, put them into practice. And then also with the editorial side of my life, I would highly suggest, even if you don't want to go the editorial route as a trainer, as somebody who might be doing exercise science or considering it, start writing more. Writing is one of the most valuable tools I think everybody can possess. And that's not only just from like an editorial or journalistic standpoint, but from a marketing standpoint, being able to language yourself better, even just being able to articulate thoughts better when it comes to your own life, being able to do that more cohesively on paper is such a skill. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like I get asked that all the time. Is it worth it to do my bachelor's in exercise science? Is it worth it to do my master's? And in some cases, no. In some cases, yes. But I think if you do decide to go that route, it can give you a level up if you're also considering, okay, how else do I implement this into where I want to take my career next? Mm -hmm. I think your your point about putting it into practice is probably the most important takeaway that that I heard through that. I think too often, you know, our heads are in the books, whereas, like you said, we're not getting out there and getting the real life experience until probably you get your degree, right? So learning it in real time, being able to take those situations that you might be put in when working with individuals and then bringing it back into the classroom with your professors and saying, hey, what happens when X, Y, Z happens? And learning that right there can just, I think, double the productivity of that degree that, that you're there for. Absolutely. And I think that's actually, you bring up a really great point. There were times I remember in school where, you know, we would talk about something, I would implement that in the gym, or I would learn something in the gym, and then I would bring it back. And then it make, almost, make it almost a case study with my professors and like, you know, students at the time who I was homies with, and we would just chat and figure it out. And to that point, it's, it's so incredibly valuable. And I think don't wait until you get your degree to start doing that stuff because I know folks from school who did that and then they either, one, didn't stick with it and it's like, okay, now you have a bachelor's in this and you're not even using it for your career because you waited and then you feel like you're behind and then you find something else to do because you feel like you're so behind that you just like kind of give up. Um, but really making sure that you're getting ahead of that and just being able to think of training in it from a different lens because now I think with social media and everything too, we have so many different points of view that – if you're not putting some of those into practice, it can almost feel so overwhelming and get you get paralysis by analysis, like looking at all these concepts without physically practicing them and figuring out, okay, what do I resonate with? How do I blend these things together? What does this actually look like in practice? Is this valuable? Do I need this? Because there is a lot of knowledge you're going to learn in academia that you likely will never implement, and that's okay. But at least you have the availability and the options to know what's realistic and what's not realistic versus like with your actual career and what you plan to do with training. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we're in the era of of information overload, specifically on 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 social media. And I think the skill set of being a really great writer can set you apart on a lot of these platforms. 
you know, acquiring the skill to create a 15 second video, a lot of people can do that. But if you really dedicate the time to becoming a really fantastic writer, you're putting that work into your captions, you're writing blog and editorial content that you use your social media platform to drive to and create extra value for your followers. I think that's really kind of the the type of creator that's going to outlast um, the short form wave that we're living through right now. 100%. I mean, it just gives you another level up on connecting with more folks, right? Because not everybody resonates with a 15 second clip. And I think we're getting to a point now where it's like you see so many things, it's like, boom, it's gone. People have already forgotten. But I think what I'm noticing, at least within myself, that I am clinging on to creators and people who I like to look up to more and more from that level of depth that makes me feel something outside of just entertain me for that 15 seconds. So the entertainment stuff is awesome. The short form is awesome. But being able to tie this nice cohesive message that I can then think about and think on myself and then maybe even put into my own articulation of writing and kind of figure out like, okay, like I really like what they said here, but how do I put that into my own life? And what does like, what does that mean to me? How can I extrapolate data from this and implement that into how I look at the world, my systems? And I think that's to your point, just it's like a level of depth that you can reach now an audience that won't necessarily always be reached from that way. So it's just a bigger shot on net regarding bringing in eyeballs to connect with you. And I think to piggyback off of this, I think where we're going now with social media too is community is going to be the biggest outlast for folks who build dynamite brands and being able to build connection is I think what people are craving more and more. That's why we're seeing a big boom in experiences and brands doing that route and brands trying to invest more in creating more of a storytelling element behind everything they do. And that all circles back to writing and be able to do that and articulate that and blend it all together and reach more people doing so. I couldn't agree more. When do you feel like you really started to put the editorial craft um, into action, you know, for your own career and start blending the fitness and wellness background with, um, the writing and media. So I think my first exposure with physically trying to write more about fitness was back when I was like 17 or 18 on Tumblr and like Tumblr throwback Tumblr. And like, it was, um, but I think about that content and I hesitate because I'm like, I don't think any of that's left on the internet, but like, if you find it, like, please don't (laughs) ever share it with me because it is so cringe. Uh, But that's when I started getting a little bit of a dip into, you know, just putting more of my thoughts out there with the training interest with writing. And then from there, I interned at a gym in college where I was personal training and they had a website and stuff. And I was like, hey, can I build your blog? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just like, I want to write and like write about the things I'm learning in school, write about the things I'm doing here in the gym with the clients we have and help them build up their blog. And then one thing leads to another. And that's just like passively doing that because I just was, had the interest there. And like my dream was to do the editorial route. And then lo and behold, Vitamin Shop Corporate found my writing on their blog and had hunted me and landed a job there as a content writer. And then lo and behold, Barbend wrote for them randomly. Cause I was like, Hey, I just want to write and like put this like topic on paper as a post activation potentiation article. And one thing led to another there and then it landed me a job. And then four years later, now I'm now running my own thing that's very based in writing. Um, so it's like this, it, it was very much like a baby step of like cringe, a little bit less cringe, a little bit less cringe. It's it's the evolution, <laughs> yeah. right? And it's, it's awesome to hear. So tell us a little bit more um, about that fit friend. Tell us, you know, what you're doing here um, and why you're so passionate about putting out this content. Yeah. And so I think the base root of that fit friend and why I started it outside of just my own interests in that niche of performance gear and also training is I think when we look around the reviews industry in these strength sports and just like the fitness space, there's a lot of BS and there's a lot of reviews out there that I think can be a little bit misleading. For example, like roundups from like a New York mag or one of these big editorials that don't have people really testing the stuff. It was kind of my nudge to be like, okay, if I wanted to build this type of content, like what would I want that to look like? What level of depth would I want to present in this that ties in the the background, the showing you everything I'm doing in the shoes and everything else? Um, it was that like need for connection and honesty that I think kind of thrust me into that fit friend. And that, that's what kind of like really lights my fire in the sense of what keeps me going when it feels like everything is like just kind of, you know, imploding out of myself and that the rat race of content and everything when I feel exhausted. But the the ability to, I think, just build 
honest reviews and try to create a community that is fostered with trust and everything else. Because it, I think with review content too, and I'm curious your thoughts here, I feel like there is a line you have to strike between integrity and capitalism because obviously you need to make money, but at the same time, like where does that pendulum swing? I think oftentimes for some of these folks, it goes way too far into the make as much money as we can, burn out all the trust at all those costs, and then where does that get us? It gets us to people not trusting content, not trusting reviews, and that Fit Friends basis, I think, is really on that, hey, I'm a small business, I'm a single dude producing all this content, I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm doing, and if you ever have questions, I'll be honest with you. Does the product suck? I'll tell you. Does it, is it great? I'll tell you. Who is it best for? And I think that's where, for me, it's really interesting to keep being in front of in the sense of the coaching background too with the brand is just being able to recognize the context in which things are great, not great for, and then, you know, building a more home, like homey, like small business feel with it. I think something that is applicable to brands, regardless of size, um, is that they need to lead with injecting more value into what they're doing, uh, creating a better product. A lot of this starts with just quality products and caring about the product that you're putting out into the world and building that trust. Um, you know, we always like to say something uh, to to the nod of leading with content and community, and that ultimately resulting in what you're looking for on a commerce front, right? So giving people and, and providing that uh, trust value to them through the content that you're producing, building real valuable community. You know how many brands don't even know where to start when it comes to n creating and nurturing a community? That would solve a lot of, you know, kind of question marks that are sitting in uh, top executives' heads right now who are in a meeting room looking at the numbers. Um, if you lead with quality community and content, it can likely solve a lot of your commerce woes. And, you know, when it comes to reviews, to your point, they've become a bit saturated, right? And we're seeing all of these tools being injected. We're seeing all these platforms who are specializing in, in bumping the SEO and bumping your top quality reviews. And problem is, and, and reality is, it's probably your, your product that you need to go back and look at, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I feel like we're, we're in this day and age now, too, where we're seeing, like, I think affiliate marketing start to die a little bit more because... Yeah. How many times do you get people just pushing product to push product to make money? And it's like, okay, great, cool. Like, I'm already forgot about it. I've already moved on. It's been interesting, too, I think, talking to brands because I buy everything I review. And they're always like, well, like, you don't have a big following, so blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, but, like, the big influencer is not going to convert for you in the sense of, you know, giving you the the trusting eyeballs that you want. And to your point, it all starts a community. And you don't need a huge community, I think, to really build a dynamite business, brand, product, et cetera. You just need enough people to understand the why and the mission and have them buy in. And then from there, just let everything else just grow organically. And that's been like, I think the basis of that fit friend too. And that's something that I'm very proud of is that the community has grown nice and slow and organically. And I love that. People are like, oh, like, well, don't, don't you want like your video go viral? I was like, no, because I don't know then who's going to be coming into the channel. Like I want people to be subscribed and like following that you know, give a damn that want to actually see the content. I don't really care about growing that fast because like, I know how much I need to get by on a day to day basis from a business context. And that allows me, I think, to be really much more conscious of that underlying element of what value am I providing you? And do you actually want to be here? We'll go to the BBCom marketing masterclass, everybody. Oh. <laughs> I agree with you. The days of the macro influencer, I think, um, have have really become depleted. Um, I think the the trust that we were just speaking to a moment ago really lives within the micro and the nano world of individuals who are wholeheartedly using these products on a daily basis. And there are some brands who are caught up with that fact and they are contracting the, that size of influencers at scale. And there are others who are blowing their entire influencer and marketing budget on the one to two nanos a quarter and scratching their heads looking at a very low ROI on, on, on those contracts. The, the big question that I always think about with that fit friend and like that idea too, of like also where I want to take this business next, which is eventually a brick and mortar is like, what is the strongest element to get you to buy a product? It's a referral from a friend, anybody in your circle that you trust that is like, Hey, this is actually a dynamite product. Like go get it. That is so much better than just seeing it really fast from a marketing lens or like a nano influencer. 
And that's, I think, also like the basis of it too, is when you think about whatever you're producing, whatever it is, like would I recommend this to a friend or would I buy this if a friend recommended it to me? And if you lead with that, it's a game changer regarding just how you conceptualize content and how you foster those connections within the people who are consuming your content. Yeah, I I, I agree. It, it's a great stress test for shoes, for supplements. Would you give this to your parents? Would you put your siblings in this? Would you put your friend of 10 years in this or, or, or uh, suggest that they start taking this on a daily basis? That's a really great filter for a good product. 100%. And I think speaking to, you know, more of the reviews industry, what I think really gets under my skin is when you see some of these reviews that are very shallow and it's just like money driven, I think about the beginner, like my mom, to your point, like when you said parents, it kind of triggered this, but it's like my mom, she likes to work out at home. She doesn't know much about fitness and stuff, but she'll go to like a, you know, a CNN and see like this nice review, but it, she doesn't realize that it's honestly all like, it's all fake for the most part in the sense of like, they're not really testing stuff. It's all affiliate driven. And it's just like, where do we, where do we walk then toe that line of, okay, like at what point guys, do we have to like, you know, create a higher barrier to entry to make a lot of this stuff way more worthwhile in the sense of consumption, producing, et cetera. And yeah, we're in a very interesting place, I think right now with the review space too. And just, I think people are losing trust in it because of the types of sites like that and the types of content like that. And it's making it very difficult, I think for me, but at the same time, speaking to the slow growth and organic and connection community standpoint, I think when people do find the channel and hopefully they're like, Oh, like, this is sick. Like I've had so many people comment like, Hey, I spent more time trying to research to find you than I actually did like anything else with the product. And it's been cool. I think seeing that, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting industry right now. And we're seeing, I think a pretty tumultuous nature of, is it really feasible to build a reviews business anymore? Like, what does that look like? And that's kind of where I'm starting to shift my mindset too with the business. Yeah, I agree. I, I want to move into topic two for the, today, the closing thought um, for our first topic. I really think everything that we're talking about really is why we're seeing the decline of the big giants that have been around for the past 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And we're seeing the rise of the quote unquote little guys, right? And you're a testament to that who are just doing really honest work. Um, people are in dire need and desperation for finding people like you. So kudos to everything you're doing. And let's let's jump into the, the meat and potatoes of today's discussion, which is topic two, footwear matters. So Jake's going to drop some knowledge on us today. And we're going to start with the question, you know, why are shoes so important for accomplishing different training goals? Yeah, for context to that fit friend, the shoes I review are cross training shoes, weightlifting shoes, barefoot shoes. All of those shoes have different purposes. And I think when we look at the footwear industry, sometimes it could be a little bit dogmatic and people can box themselves into one thing. And I think looking at shoes as tools in the sense of how are you training? What are your preferences? How are you moving? That's the more productive way to look at shoes. And so it's, for example, like my folks out there who love barefoot shoes and love training barefoot. I am all for it. I train barefoot often. I train in barefoot shoes often, but I'm also not necessarily limiting myself to that type of footwear alone. And I implement all of these different types of shoes based on what I'm doing. If I'm doing a CrossFit wad, for example, and I ran the day before, I might be feeling more beat up. And if I train barefoot or in barefoot shoes, the amount of stress and just load on my body in terms of the ground reaction, the force, it might be too much. So being able to build this lens of, okay, how am I training? What am I doing? What are my preferences? How am I moving? And then blending that with different types of footwear, I think that's the secret sauce. And I think when people finally start adapting that mindset of, okay, what type of footwear is going to allow me to perform my best? And this is the type of footwear that isn't, you know, blanketed with my biases or my brand royalty that I just buy every time. Like I'm a Nike guy. I buy Nike. Okay. But those Nikes are actually subpar for what you're doing. Like if you get out of that lens and mindset of this is what I've always done. And you look at shoes instead of, Hey, this is a tool solely to prop up my performance and my comfort and my preference. It changes the game. And that's how I try to language shoes on the channel in the sense of, Hey, I like to use a little bit of everything based on what I'm doing. Now, how you want to do it, that's your own bread and butter. Like figure that out as you go, do a lot of trial and error, do a lot of testing to see. But leading with that mindset of this is solely a tool to get me from point A to point B in the most efficient and, you know, best way possible regarding my biomechanics and how I'm moving. 
Where do we even start on the hunt for a good shoe for something like this? Like there's toe drop, there's a neutral, mm -hmm. there are all, there's all this terminology out there, right? And we go to the product pages on, you know, the big footwear brands and we will read the details. Well, what if you don't have a clue, right? And you're looking to, to get a new pair, uh, you know, we can put a specific sport into place, but kind of what are the key uh, features and characteristics that you're looking to take into account? Yeah, so let's talk cross-training shoes. I feel like that's the broadest topic regarding what people are using in the gym. This is the type of shoe that you're going to use for a little bit of everything. You can lift in them. You can do some short runs, give or take. Like every cross-training shoe is a little bit different in that context. But then also it's a shoe that you can do agility and different type of versatile workouts, maybe some hidden. And when you look at cross-training shoes, like think of them on this massive spectrum of stability, versatility somewhere on the line, the shoe is going to fall. And that's where you're going to then think about, okay, how am I training every week? If you're somebody, for example, lifting three times a week, you do a hit class, and then you maybe do some short runs, you're going to want a shoe that probably toes that line a little bit more on the versatility side. So you're going to want something that's a little bit more plush and a little bit more responsive, but you also want it to be stable enough to lift in. Now, when we start to focus in on that and how you plan to use that shoe, then we could start diving into some of these construction details. And if there's anything you take away from this podcast with cross training shoes, three construction details that can really be huge to think about that really aren't that complex that you could pretty much identify pretty fast from a product page is number one, the midsole of the shoe. This is that layer of material that separates the outsole, AKA the bottom of the shoe from the foot. So it's that foam layer that is going to dictate how much stability and responsiveness that shoe has. Generally speaking, lighter density foams, more plush foams, they'll be a little bit more bouncy, they'll be a bit more comfortable. And then you'll have like, you know, lower stack height, aka the height of that midsole, the shoe itself, that height of material that separates your foot from the floor will be lower, it'll be a bit more dense, that's going to give you more stability and balance. And so when you think about what you're doing for this person who's lifting, doing some hit and doing some short runs, they'll want something that probably toes that middle ground a little bit more on the edge of versatility again, it's going to be a bit more responsive and comfortable, it's not going to beat them up when they're running if they're not used to running on a denser surface. The second feature to consider is the outsole. Now, when you're thinking about how you're training, so you're that person that you lift, you do some hit, you run. I feel like we need a shoe here. I feel <laughs> I, like you need, I feel like he's going to take a shoe off, everybody. Go look at YouTube. <laughs> okay, this is also a running shoe, so like we're going to have to like... <laughs> we're just going to use the pieces of the shoe. Yeah. yeah. So midsole is the foam material right here. As you can see, like a running shoe, very bouncy, very plush. Now, running shoes, we're not going to dive into them right now, but they have a huge range of midsoles and feels and et cetera, et cetera. But for the cross-training shoe example, this wouldn't be a good shoe for lifting in. This wouldn't be a good shoe for somebody who does that lifting, hit, training, like running bias because likely you won't get the stability you want for your lifting context. And because you're lifting more than you're doing hit and running, that would indicate to me, hey, you should probably look for a training shoe for this. And then if you want to do longer runs, maybe find a running shoe for that or find a separate shoe for that. The second construction feature to look at is the outsole. So this is the bottom of the shoe. This is going to be what's going to give you traction and grip in the gym. So when you're thinking about how you're training, so lifting, hit, doing some short runs, generally speaking, what are the surfaces you're training on? Are you training on turf? Are you training on rubber gym floors, wooden platforms, et cetera? That will dictate what type of outsole you should be looking for on a product page. When in doubt, generally speaking, if you go for outsoles that are fully rubber or mostly rubber, you'll be in a really good spot. It's going to give you a bit more durability. It's going to give you a bit more traction. And that is why also for like a running shoe here, you have more exposed foam. They're trying to save on weight and whatnot. There's enough tread to give you durability and grip, but they're also trying to save on weight. With a training shoe, you got to think like, okay, if I'm doing a lateral skater jump on turf, I want this to be able to grip me down. This might not give me enough grip and traction. So when you're thinking about how you're training in your shoe, the outsole can be incredibly important. And if you are varying your surfaces and you just want more durability, going for shoes that have full rubber outsoles, near full rubber outsoles can be huge. And from there, we could talk durability, but we're not going to unpack that there. And that's where a lot of the wear testing does come into play and watching reviews can be really useful. The third construction characteristic that I want to talk about is the upper construction. So the upper is basically the upper of the shoe. It's all the material that locks your foot down. This is incredibly important because when we're thinking about how we're training, this is what's going to give our foot security. It's going to help us from spilling over the out midsole here. So for example, if you have a shoe that is designed for, let's say, hit, but it's not the best for lifting, if you're, for example, going for a power clean and you are catching the weight and you start to spill over, that's going to hinder your ability to perform well, be efficient with your lifts. And then also it's just going to be not that comfortable. And 
you never know what can happen when you're wearing a shoe that has an upper that's letting you spill over. I don't want to talk injury because it's not an always injury, but there are things like that that can come into play there. So the upper construction can be incredibly important. And when you think about how you're training, if you're lifting, if you're doing any form of explosive work, you're generally going to want to find an upper that locks down the foot pretty well. So looking at shoes that have like knit biases like this model, this isn't designed to give you max stability. I mean, max security if you're doing multi-directional work, for example. It's designed to lock you down enough for running, aka running forward, and give you ventilation while you're running. But for a cross-training shoe, you're going to want something that's going to be a little bit more reinforced with the layers. If you're doing a lot of lateral work, looking at the upper and seeing if there's reinforced here on the lateral forefoot can be really important. Looking for materials that will be a little bit more resilient to your general wear and tear. So for example, if you're a CrossFit athlete, Finding a cross-training shoe that's built for CrossFit can be incredibly important because generally speaking, those shoes will have reinforced layers at high abrasion points, aka the midfoot, the heel, for handstand push-ups, for rope climbs, for burpees on the toe box, you'll have a reinforced toe guard, extra synthetic layers, additional materials here. And considering the security can be incredibly important, and then you have those three features, from there, that's when it can be really useful to then consider durability. But from that, for, on that context, you're not going to generally see that on a product page. That's where watching reviews and just listening to the communities who are wearing the shoe already can be really important. So all that to say, three features for a cross training shoe to consider. Midsole, that's going to dictate your versatility, stability. Outsole, that will dictate your grip, traction, and overall durability of the shoe and how you're protecting the bottom of the shoe. And the upper construction, aka the upper on the shoe, that is going to give you security and lockdown when you're doing your various forms of training. Thanks for the real-time demo, Jake. You can go ahead and put your shoe back on now. Sure, <laughs> you want to switch here. back over to, to Spotify or Apple, and now's your time. Um, you know, so it's safe to say that finding the right shoe not only can help you perform better, but it can play a role in injury prevention, right? Um, I don't think... I don't think that consideration um, gets taken a whole bunch by Gen Pop, right? I think we often like to reach for what looks the coolest, um, maybe what's the most comfortable. Um, comfort is surely something to consider, but there are times uh, to take into account. I'm going to say like Olympic weightlifting for the perfect example. You want that really flat, solid surface underneath you. I mean, you should, if you're going for Olympic weightlifting, Invest in a pair of weightlifting shoes. I mean, yeah. you, you've reviewed a bunch of weightlifting shoes. What would you say about weightlifting specifically? Yeah, the weightlifting shoes can be a fantastic tool for anybody who wants to get into the sport of weightlifting or if you are, for example, a CrossFit athlete and you're doing weightlifting on a regular basis or if you're just a recreational lifter and you do want to explore that type of footwear for getting more into clean snatches, etc., they can be really useful because with a weightlifting shoe, the midsole is going to be entirely different. And think of this as like you're going to your toolbox, you're finding this specific type of footwear for this activity. They can also be great for squats because of this type of construction that they have. And three call-outs of weightlifting shoes to take into account for this sport is when you're doing any form of weightlifting, you generally want to be catching weight with a more upright torso in a deeper range of motion. So catching a clean at the bottom or squatting to depth, for example. What a weightlifting shoe is going to have is it's going to have an elevated heel. That is going to put your foot into a plantar flex position before you physically start lifting, which then can allow the knees to track a little bit further, which can then allow you to feel like you can sink your hips back a bit more, get more depth while maintaining more upright torso. And so with a weightlifting shoe, three things to think about here, similar to our cross training shoe, is the height of the heel. If you know, for example, that you struggle with mobility or you struggle keeping an upright torso when catching weight in a clean, or if you're just having trouble with depth in the squat, a higher heel can generally be a good bet, but most weightlifting shoes will have a heel height around like 0.75 inches. And that's usually a good bet for most lifters. The second thing that a weightlifting shoe will have, to your point, is like that nice stable outsole or that nice like very firm outsole. And that's designed to allow you to catch the weight from a nice stable context while also really feeling the floor and getting a nice grip. Generally, weightlifting shoes will have a full rubber outsole. If you're buying a weightlifting shoe that doesn't, I would say probably pass on that shoe. It's not going to be worth it. Um, so you have a higher heel elevation. You have a very stable and grippy outsole. And then you also have, similar to the cross-training shoe, a reinforced upper. But with weightlifting shoes, you'll generally have straps or even like a boa lacing system like on the Adidas Lesting models that give you additional security. And this prevents any form of spillover because to our point, like if you're catching a clean in a cross-training shoe with a really loose upper and you're spilling over a weightlifting shoe will have like dual straps to really lock that foot down generally like leather uppers or synthetic uppers that are really going to lock the feet down to prevent any form of spillover um, 
But all that to say, yeah, weightlifting shoes can be a super specific tool. And another question that I get asked with weightlifting shoes while we're on this topic is, do beginners need them? Does everybody need them? And in most cases, probably not. But I do think they're a really useful tool to just have in your toolbox. And generally, weightlifting shoes will last you a while because they will offer just a different way to train. I think it's very important to, for example, squat with a zero drop or a flat foot position, but then also with a weightlifting shoe, depending on what your goals are. I think a lot of folks, and to your point with like the injury context, is we often don't realize that something's a problem until it is. And a lot of this could just easily be prevented by using the right tools at the right times. And it's like a great example is like, okay, you're front squatting and you're squatting barefoot and you don't realize like when you get to a threshold, like your torso is dropping so much that you can't physically move efficiently. A weightlifting shoe could actually help prevent all that, allow you to perform to your fullest. And then you could also just implement any form of other squat variation, leg variation with a flatter foot position. So you still get to train in that range of motion and whatnot. Um, right. Uh, it, you know, it, it's crazy to think, I mean, you can be it's really the repetition that catches up to you. If you're going day in and day out or week over week over week for a matter of years, right? And maybe you don't have the best ankle mobility or maybe, you know, you're, to your point, you're not able to maintain the best spinal position or, or, or even, you know, posture position within the catches or within our squats specifically. That 0.75 inch can do so much for you just by investing in, in a pair of shoes that hopefully, at least in the, all of the Olympic weightlifting shoes that I've invested in, will last you for a year. You know, um, it's not similar to running shoes where you're going through a couple hundred miles and then you've got to throw them in the trash to get new ones, right? This really is an investment that that should, if you're buying the right pair, last you for many years. I really loved what you said about uh, looking at shoes um, as going into your toolbox for the activity that resonated with me so clearly because it makes sense. Like I have my running shoes. I have my weightlifting shoes. I'm not, um, <laughs> my Ollie lifting days are well behind me, but I have my strength shoes. I'll call them right for my general sh- squat, deadlift, et cetera days. Um, I have the pair of shoes where I'm doing a little bit more of my explosive and agility work. And I have the cross trainers. And then I've got my super cushion, comfy shoes when I r- ran 13 miles the day before, and I want to offload my foot the next day. So um, shoes really are an important accessory um, to to keeping up, keeping up with the demands that you're looking to put onto your body if you're somebody who really is continuing to push the limits no matter how old you are. Um, but then also just helping you stay safe, which I think is probably the bigger takeaway here because um, let's be frank, you know, as people age, you know, their days of the Olympic weightlifting and, you know, pushing themselves as hard as they may be used to in CrossFit classes will start to decline, but they're going to still move their bodies and, you know, picking the right shoe wear can set you up for success there. A hundred percent. I think one of my favorite examples is sometimes I'll get comments and it's like, well, I can use my running shoes for this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's fine. And you can, for sure. You can wear whatever shoe you want to the gym and they'll work until they don't. And that's where I think understanding to your point, like, where those thresholds exist to where that gets more important is really important for the longevity of it. It's preventative. A hundred percent. You can get away with, you know, training whatever shoe you want, but once you start moving enough weight or you start doing a specific type of activity like a CrossFit or a HIT class that has a lot of multidirectional work, that is where that is going to matter more. And it's like on the spectrum of specificity, similar to how we approach most things in life, as you get more specific, that's where it's going to need to get more dialed in. Yeah, I agree. You mentioned barefoot training before, and I want to I want to specify this one. I want to give it its own moment because it did have its own moment. Um, I feel like uh, in in the in the fitness culture for a number of years, and it still does, right? I still see I still go into the gym on a daily basis, and I see people popping off their shoes to to crank out some deadlifts. Um, so, is it over? And and. If we're over it, why did it end? Uh, let's talk about the rise to its fame and the science behind why people were going barefoot training. A lot of this came from, well, let's break the mold of the over cushioned and really develop that foot connection with the ground, right? Um, but we, like always, we humans tend to go overboard on things. So let's talk about kind of the the problem that started its its rise to fame, and then let's talk about why we're a bit more conservative with it today. Yeah, I think. Barefoot training and just barefoot shoes in general really started to gain traction and be on the rise with the ideas that we should be, you know, allowing our feet to spread and splay and move. And sometimes shoes will take us away from that. And when you're wearing a certain type of shoe for so long, you are kind of like almost like 
putting it into a cast might be a little bit dramatic, but you are kind of putting your foot into a position that's not allowing it to do its natural thing. And so is it in the decline? I don't think so. I think we're actually seeing the biggest boom of barefoot shoe use and barefoot training that we've ever seen. And I think it's because we're finally starting to get more mainstream coverage of barefoot shoes and the benefits of training barefoot. And when we talk about its rise and like why I think it caught fire, it's because it just makes a lot of sense once you do take off that shoe and you start training and you're like, oh, like this actually feels awesome. I'm moving in ranges of motion that I didn't even think about. My foot and ankle actually feel great. Now up the chain, like my knees actually feel a little bit better. My hips feel a little bit better. And it's because you're giving now yourself an exposure to ranges of motion and like it's strengthening intrinsic muscles that you might not have been hitting when you were wearing the certain type of shoe for so long. And so all that to say, I think a few things to keep in mind with like the boom of it is number one, just getting your foot and ankle into different positions and really allowing those intrinsic deeper muscles to strengthen that might not be strengthened in shoes has been really important in the sense of why people are adapting this type of training. Number two, I think just the proprioceptive elements of feeling the ground below the feet can be really powerful for folks when they feel it for the first time. I feel so balanced. I feel so stable. Like this feels great. Like my deadlifts, I've never felt better and I'm deadlifting barefoot and everything else. And then there's also just the component, I think, of folks looking at it from like this bigger holistic picture of, okay, from my mindset of like using shoes as tools, I am a huge proponent of barefoot shoes and training barefoot, even if you like cross training shoes, running shoes, et cetera, because you're exposing your body to so many different ranges of motion that you're basically ticking all these boxes. You're like, okay, I'm getting like the best of all these worlds here. I'm building my feet and ankles, but still not necessarily only training barefoot and training in barefoot shoes because I recognize that I do like weightlifting shoes for my squats, et cetera. And I think people are starting to finally realize like, okay, like this is actually just a tool and a means to an end to give me like the best performance possible and to build just dynamite ankles, feet, and lower body in general regarding just my health, integrity of the tissues, and everything else. Where do we teeter, teeter the line of going overboard with barefoot training and opening ourselves up to the increased risk of injury? Yeah, and this is always a very complex topic, and there are a lot of strong opinions on this on the internet. But I think where we get into trouble is when we create almost this boxed in mindset of this type of footwear and we only think we can use it for that type of thing and that's like the only thing we can use for health purposes because it's interesting too because I have a couple of friends who do PT and they're starting to actually like because I talk to them a lot about like footwear choices of their clients and stuff but they're starting to see more folks come to them with issues with their feet and ankles from using too much barefoot shoe usage too fast like this is a type of footwear that you have to acclimate to the way you're going to feel the ground below your feet when training especially when doing plyos and running is going to be very different there's going to be a lot more force going through those joints and so you want to make sure you're really strategic with it. And I think where we get into trouble is when we create an identity and a box in mindset with this type of footwear, and we don't allow ourselves to be more objective with, okay, is this the most productive thing I should be using in this moment? Or am I trying to force it? And at the same time, like, at what cost? Because now like I have like a stress issue or some other issue going on. And I think that's where we can get into trouble. And I think for folks too, who might have some abnormality with their movement, I think at times barefoot shoes, they can be really useful for helping that, but equally they can also exacerbate that. For example, like if you have any form of tenderness on your heel and you're like afraid to put weight on it and you're wearing a barefoot shoe, that's going to be felt a lot greater. And so then you might actually bias your movement more. And so I think just making sure that you're objective with your choices of footwear based off of what's going to allow you to objectively perform and feel your best on paper, not with what you want to do or what you think you should be doing because social media told you to, that's where we need to really focus in and hone in on. I think we, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything you just said. I think we have to remind ourselves how delicate our feet are, right? Just because we're on our feet all day long, we have to be conscious of how much force, to your point, in explosive movements and running we're putting on those metatarsals. Um, if we're feeling tenderness in the fascia, running up to the Achilles, which is a huge injury that no one really wants to experience, right? Impacting that, that Achilles. Um, you know, um, I think what we often see, we see plenty of stress reactions and stress fractures already in regular shoes from people going too hard, too fast and ramping up their mileage far too quickly. I mean, if you're going from zero miles, you signed up for your first 10K race, let's say, and you go from zero miles to you're running 15 miles a week. I mean, something's going to give there, right? You have to be slow in your progression up 
towards running the mileage that you need. And I think the same applies to barefoot training, right? Um, you know, if, if I'm working with somebody and, and they don't have the best, you know, foot connection with the ground or they're, they've just historically worn very cushioned shoes, or maybe it's somebody who wears heels all day, right? They're often some of the worst um, when it comes to understanding how that foot should actually perform in a stable spot when they're strength training, right? Maybe they've never strength trained. So, you know, be conservative, take things slow, start with body weight movements, like master a body weight squat, master a, a kettlebell deadlift, right? Before you start ramping things up and certainly before you start introducing explosive moments and anything, you know, a little bit more um, impactful on the feet um, in a barefoot or in a barefoot shoe. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point. And I think for anybody considering barefoot shoes and barefoot training, don't fall victim into that mindset of like, you see comments of like, well, this is how humans should be moving. And look at this person. They did a hundred, like they're not you. The cavemen did it. Exactly. I think that the, the lack of the multifactorial nature of barefoot shoe usage and just training histories, past injuries, like these are all things that should be considered just because this guy can go run a marathon with awesome form barefoot. That doesn't mean I could ever do that, but that also doesn't mean that I can't use barefoot shoes for running. It just might look different. And to your point, I think that's where we get into a lot of trouble is when we start letting these other opinions who say like, this should be it, or this is how it should be. Or like, or like think of these like case studies, look at them do it. That's not you. And it's sim like, we, we talk about all the time with training, right? Where it's like, oh, well, this person is not you in the sense of how they've grown, how they move, et cetera. So why are we doing the same thing with barefoot shoes? It just doesn't make any sense. And so scale it back, acclimate slowly. Remember where the context lies of your experiences, background, et cetera, and then go from there to your point. Yeah, the high heel. Cool, you've shortened your Achilles for how many years and now you're going to go squat with- Or you're going to go to a boot camp and yeah. just bounce up and down in a flat foot. Yeah, people forget that that tissue takes time to acclimate. And yeah, if you, if you have been wearing running shoes longer, for example, you might need more time and that's totally okay. And how you acclimate, there are so many ways to do that. And we could totally unpack that probably in a whole nother three hour podcast. <laughs> but all that to say, I love that point. And I think you drove it home with, you have to remember where you are when you're starting to implement this because it's going to look very different than somebody who's been doing it for years and they're already used to it. And a fair warning. I mean, you by all means can blow it off and go for it and try it by yourself, but the feet take a really long time to heal. And I'll shout out my friends at Bespoke Physical Therapy who we've had here on the podcast before. Um, not a lot of blood flow goes down, you know, into that area to, to heal. So if you find yourself with a stress reaction, with a stress fracture, with plantar fasciitis, um, it's going to take some time. So just do your due diligence, set yourself up for success with the preventative measures. Because when you do experience a foot uh, injury, it's going to take a bit for, for that area of your body to heal. Um, you know, the most humbling type of rehab that I think I have, have had um, included exercises like towel drags uh -huh. with like towel scrunches with your toes and you just put a you know a small hand towel on the floor take your socks off be barefoot put your foot on top of that and try to scrunch that towel closer and closer to your heel just by using your toes and see how quickly the arch of your foot starts uh, cramping on you. Um, another one is uh, picking up marbles with your foot and placing them from one uh, spot in the room to another and just using all those muscle fibers and those small muscle stabilizers that you really never isolate. Um, again, very humbling. So don't sleep on, on foot strength. Don't sleep on, you know, showing your feet the right love that they need. Um, and if you've had a long day on your feet, you know, sometimes the better thing to do is just rest and not push the limits. So show your feet some love. 100%. So Jake, your wealth of knowledge when it comes to footwear, especially for activities, why are you now shifting your e-commerce efforts uh, to a brick and mortar experience and how are you planning to stand out against the rest? Yeah. So when I look at that fit friend from a top level down, I think the community and everything that it's been built with, with the sense of folks who are just really interested in shoes has been awesome. And I think the, the way to take the brand next for me personally is to add another level of connection. And I think being able to not only review the shoes, but then also being able to sell them through the site and give you all the context and info you need blended with that review content is going to be really important, but then also potentially exploring brick and mortars. And that's where I'm at now. And the reason for that is one, the connection element, but two, when we think about cross training shoes, weightlifting shoes, barefoot shoes, like where do you go to try those on? There's nowhere. A few stores will carry some, sure, like Dick's Sporting Goods. They'll carry like the big Nike, the Under Armour. Where do you go to try the Strike Movement, the Rad One? 
the tier, the born primitive, some of these smaller brands that arguably make better shoes than these big brands, but you can't try on anywhere. And sizing is always a pain. And that's the bane of my existence as reviewers trying to give sizing recommendations. <sighs> but all that to say, I think building this store that is really fitness focused with the footwear that it's going to have is needed. There really isn't a store that's doing that right now, at least at scale in the sense of where to go in this city, where to go in this city. And where do you go to find like, okay, the proper sizing or like the proper information for, Hey, I do this type of training. Like what shoe should I go to? You can go to deck shore and you'll get like, you know, your baseline. Okay. This is for cross training, but like what type of cross training? If you buy a Nike Metcon nine, for example, for cross training, but you also like to run, that shoe's going to beat the heck out of you. So where do you go to find that? And that's kind of the idea behind where I want to take everything next is connection, but then also be an outlet and a resource for folks who want to try stuff on before they buy that you just can't find anywhere. And I think being able to do that and aggregate that sizing data and just provide better information for folks will hopefully then help bring down return rates, better for the environment, better for the company, better for the consumer. All these things that could be nice little wins with this type of vertical. Well, Jake, we wish you the best of luck when it comes to this endeavor and, and bringing this to life. It's certainly certainly going to be a journey for yourself. I, I want you to to leave the the listeners with a good way to follow uh, you and that fit friend on this journey that you're taking on. Yeah. So the best place to reach me is either on YouTube or Instagram, that fit friend. And then if you ever have questions on shoes, drop a comment, reach out to me. I literally answer every DM, every comment. Honestly, I, I feel like most days it's like a blur because I am answering so many questions, but I try to hit everybody back and that's really important to me. So if you ever have questions, always feel free to reach out. You can hit me on my personal Instagram, Jake underscore B-O-L-Y. I will respond to you there too. So there are a lot of different ways you can reach me. If I ever don't respond, just hit me on another platform. I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like I totally forgot and I will hit you back. The man is accessible, everybody. Jake, thanks so much for stopping by the studio today here at BBCom. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor. Thanks for tuning in to another episode here at bodybuilding.com. Stay tuned for more stories along the way.